Hello, Slashaholics. Tonight's narration is brought to you by Jugbo Electronic Training Collars. Jugbo's collars are very safe and effective. Uh, they have three different modes. Uh, one is just the beep, uh, which is what you're recommended to start with, and it's got eight levels to choose from. Uh, then you move up to vibration with the beeps, and the vibration has up to 16 levels, so you can you know figure out which one is best for your dog. And the actual uh, static uh, correction, the shock, is uh, 1 to 99 levels. And even towards the top levels, it's still a very weak correction uh, shock. Um, this thing works up, the control for it works up to uh, 3,300 feet, which is quite impressive. Um, the collar length starts at 24.5 inches, uh, but you can cut it off and burn the end to make it fit. And uh, this particular collar... And you can buy one yourself. It's going to be in the description below on, uh, with an Amazon link. Is meant for dogs over 10 pounds. I have two dogs that are brothers. Uh, their names are Zoll and Vince Clortho. Um, I live out in the country, my wife and I. And Zoll likes to stick around the house and the, and the deck whenever he's not inside. But Vince Clortho is one of them dogs that likes to run out in the road. Uh, and I've been so concerned uh, that I was going to lose him one day because of that. Uh, people drive down our road out here just crazy. But with the Jugbo Corrective Collar, within a week, just one week, uh, he has no interest in the road anymore. Uh, so this has done a really good job. Uh, really, it's probably saved Vince Clortho's life. And for that, uh, Jugbo, I really appreciate you sending this out. And uh, if anybody listening right now is interested in trying it out, it's got a really great price. Like I said, the link will be in the description and pinned comment below. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Jugbo. Uh, I really appreciate the electronic training collar. And so does Vince Clortho. And Slashaholics, by using the link below and the promo code in the description and pinned comment with the address to the Amazon listing, you will get 10% off your very own Jugbo electronic training collar. Without further ado, here's tonight's narration. Of Friday the 13th, The Curse of the Jersey Devil, by Rashad M. Moore. Chapter 2 It's been 30 years since I last seen him, but I refuse to think that he's dead, said Marcus Duke. I know that it's been hard for you over the years, but I think it is best for you to consider that he's gone, said Miss Bishop. Marcus, you are a grown man now, and you need to accept that Creighton Duke is likely gone, said Miss Bishop. Marcus replied, I don't have to accept that because you and I both know that Jason Voorhees is real and that he's still likely around killing people at that godforsaken camp. Honey, you have to live your life for you ultimately. Miss Bishop was one of Marcus's close neighbors who lived in his apartment complex in Hackensack, New Jersey. He had known her for almost eight years, and she was like a mother to him. Though they weren't related, they had grown close to each other, sharing intimate stories about their past lives. Miss Bishop was an old 72-year-old black woman who was a practitioner of voodoo that had a Louisiana accent. She cared much for Marcus and would often perform protection rituals on him to help keep him safe. She had a daughter named Calida. When Calida was about five years old, her father, Mr. Bishop, a master in the voodoo arts, was killed and betrayed by his progeny, the Lakeshore Strangler, Charles Lee Ray. Charles, a.k.a. Chucky, was a native of Hackensack, and at one time was considered to be a friend of the family. Only the Bishop family, at the time, was aware that Charles had the ability to possess people through the power of the great Dambala. Calida didn't want Marcus to end up like her father, so she cared for Marcus and would also look out for him in the neighborhood, in her own kind of way. Miss Bishop, now with all due respect, Auntie, I would think that it would be crystal clear to you as to what my intentions are with going down to Crystal Lake. Even though I didn't intend of doing it, I'm on the path to following in my uncle's footsteps. He trained and he hunted. I train, and I'm going to hunt that abomination of a being we call Jason Voorhees. Fuck Jason Voorhees. I know exactly who I'm up against, and I ain't going to let some overgrown pussy-ass mama's boy discourage me from giving him what he deserves. My uncle knew Jason's family, and they made an agreement that my uncle Creighton Duke told me that I had to keep, if he wasn't around. 
I'm keeping that promise, Marcus continued. It's that time of year, and I've been hearing things about things that pertain to Crystal Lake. I mean, what about that company? No, they're actually a law firm that bought some property over there in the town of Crystal Lake. I've seen some of their people before, and boy, are they some odd people. I don't trust them. Well, for starters, I saw two of them in Hackensack walking and driving around town, going in and out of bodegas and magic shops, and then I saw them going into a McDonald's. But that's besides the point, Marcus said. Tell me, Sonny, what do you expect to find when you go there? Closure? Clarity? asked Miss Bishop. I'm looking for answers, whatever and wherever it may be, said Marcus. I have an objective, and it needs to be fulfilled. I spent most of my life preparing to fight him, and this is the right time to go looking. He killed my uncle and so many others. How many more people are going to die or come up missing because of Jason Voorhees? Marcus was aware of Miss Bishop's spiritual abilities and had indulged himself in a few practices of his own. He had been studying different magical systems since he was a teenager. Marcus was now 35 years old. He had no offspring and was not married or even had a girlfriend. His life was too plagued with tribulations to be involved with intimate relationships. But he had experiences that gave him deep insight into the human psyche. For the most part, Marcus comes off as a quiet, respectful guy who mostly only speaks when necessary. Right out of high school, he joined the military, where he served six years as an operations specialist then went to college for another six years where he obtained a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in parapsychology. He stands six feet tall and weighs around a lean and muscular 200 pounds. He has trained his muscles to be rock solid and conditioned them for longevity, but not overly muscled, but in all the necessary places. As far as his combative skills go, Marcus isn't so much a fan of guns, though he knows how to shoot accurately and on target. He is more into close quarter, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and is a practitioner of the system of Defendu and Defendo. One system made by the elusive British combative W.E. Fairbairn and the other by a crafty Canadian commando named Bill Underwood. Both systems were great for neutralizing the opposition. They are deadly military martial arts systems. Marcus had also trained extensively in mixed martial arts. All of this training to eventually face Jason. Marcus is kind of a solipsist when it comes to dealing with people, but he knows not to underestimate anyone and their potential capabilities. It had been something that he learned first-handedly in the Navy. Though Marcus is a very capable human being, he often contemplates committing suicide. His post-traumatic stress that he developed in the military often plagues his mood, and back then, with the sudden absence of his uncle, it contributed immense amounts of trauma to him as a child. Creighton Duke was his uncle, and had raised him for the first five years of his life. Marcus has a strong memory and could remember when Creighton Duke would tell him stories about the beast, Jason Voorhees. It was kind of much to take in as a child, hearing the horror stories about Jason. Marcus was only five years old when his uncle was presumed dead. Marcus always perceived Creighton as a father figure, but when he went missing, Marcus would be put into a foster care center. Throughout his early childhood and teenage years, he was sent to two different households, up until the age of 12. Marcus lived at an adoption center in New York City. When he was 10 years old, Marcus had developed a crush on one of the girls that lived at the foster center with him. Her name was Christina, with a K. Christina had green eyes, lighter tan skin, and was of Puerto Rican descent. She often was nice to him. She smiled and hugged Marcus when she noticed he was sad. One time they even kissed. That made Marcus very happy since it was his first time. Though he communicated and played with other children, she had been the closest person to him since his uncle. When Marcus was 11, Christina got adopted. He was able to say goodbye to her. The last thing Marcus said to Christina before she left was, Be nice to your family, like how you were with me, so that they love you back to prevent you from coming back here. Christina smiled at him and looked him in his brown eyes and told him, Okay, I love you. 
Then she kissed him on the cheek, gave him a tight hug, and went into the passenger seat of the vehicle and drove away with her new family. After Christina had left, Marcus had become so lonely, he had mostly kept to himself that last year at the foster center. Next, Marcus was sent to a foster family a week before his 13th birthday. The family resided in suburbia, New Jersey. They were a white Caucasian family that was of the economical lower middle class. On the day of Marcus's 13th birthday, the family had made a birthday cake for him, a large chocolate cake with vanilla icing, a cake that Marcus often enjoyed eating at the foster center. The family was a small one. It consisted of a mother, Mrs. Brixton, a father, Mr. Brixton, and two children, Emily, age 11, and Alex, age 9. Mr. Brixton was a good-hearted man. He often displayed his care for Marcus and had been the one who made the cake for him. He was a jolly, middle-aged white man that enjoyed the small things in life. That's what he taught Marcus to always enjoy, the small things in life, when times get tough. Hey, buddy. That's what Mr. Brixton would call Marcus, his buddy. It made Marcus feel wanted, like he had a friend, a figure to look up to, a father. Mrs. Brixton wasn't as friendly to Marcus as her husband. She often questioned the ethics of the young boy, while she kept a close eye on most of his actions. As for the children, little Alex and Emily openly embraced Marcus. They would often play tag outside, play hide-and-seek inside, and play video games together. They were a cute little family and had lived together for two years with Marcus. One day, Marcus was told that he had to leave because of some speculations that he was stealing loads of money from Mrs. Brixton's purse. It was actually Emily who had been stealing the money, but Mrs. Brixton had animosity towards Marcus and was looking for any excuse to get rid of him. Mr. Brixton fought hard to keep Marcus as a member of the family, but the two adults' frequent arguments started to infect the morale of the family, so Marcus had to leave. On the day of Marcus's departure, Mr. Brixton hugged Marcus tightly and then touched his face with his two hands, looked Marcus directly in his eyes, and told him that he loved him and that he will see him again one day. And to remember to enjoy the small things in life. Then Marcus was sent back to the adoption center in New York City. Marcus stayed at that adoption center for a whole year before he had been sent to live with another family. During that year, Marcus had enjoyed walking around the city, and since he was 16, he had freedoms that the younger children did not. He enjoyed hanging out at Union Square and Times Square. He also liked going to the movies and riding his bike. He would often go to the pizza shops where they sold dollar slices of pizza. Marcus really enjoyed being around the masses of people in the city when he was a teenager. The environment was so diverse, and he could learn from so many different cultures. When Marcus was 16, he was sent to another foster family, but this one was in the inner city of Newark, New Jersey. He lived with the Black family, a mother and a son. They were more on the poor side of the economic spectrum, but good people. Miss Sugarman was a lady in her early fifties, short compared to Marcus, a little hefty and very dark-skinned. Her cooking abilities impressed Marcus. She often asked him what he wanted to eat, which made him feel accommodated. Marcus grew to love her and was grateful that he had met her. Her son, Dwayne, was a year older than Marcus. He was a tall, slender-bodied kid that had braids and possessed an insensitive sense of humor. He would often tell Marcus that he was too passive and that he needed to let his balls drop. Dwayne had a reputation for being a great fighter in the streets. He was the one who taught Marcus how to fight. Marcus stayed with the family for two years until he left to the military. During his early times in the service, Marcus would often visit Dwayne and Miss Sugarman. You are trained prepared, ready to face your demons, and no one has the answers to your questions except you, said Miss Bishop. Miss Bishop said with enthusiastic charisma, Remember, when you're about to accomplish your destiny, be advised that you will be in the middle of a crossroad, and it is up to you to look in all directions. Marcus had a serious, militant look on his face. I'll keep that in mind, he said. I am grateful for everything that you have taught me, and I will surely put my knowledge of the magics to use. Miss Bishop looked at Marcus in a nurturing way, took a deep breath, and said, Baby, 
You have been through so much in your life. You have overcome that which many have fallen prey to. Your uncle would be proud of you and how far you have come. It is to you to decide what your fate is, and when you do, your mind will be clear, and in that ultimately up moment, you will have found peace within yourself. Know that Dambala will be with you. Now how about you eat some of this jambalaya gumbo that I made for you, suggested Miss Bishop. It's a family recipe that originates from New Orleans. Try it. Marcus gazed at her seriously for a moment and then smiled hard. All right, I'll try it, said Marcus, humoredly. I do enjoy your Louisiana cuisine, thanks. You're welcome, baby, said Miss Bishop with a smile on her face. The two sat in the apartment for the remainder of the hour, and then Marcus went back to his apartment. His apartment was mostly empty. He had a king-size bed, a refrigerator, a small table with a laptop on it, and a TV. It was an apartment of a bachelor, like that of a minimalist. On the bed lay two large black duffel bags, filled and zipped. Marcus had packed to leave. He said to himself out loud, Am I ready for this? I mean... I guess I am, but I bet so many other people thought the same thing about confronting Jason. And look how they ended up. Anyways, no excuses. Ball dropping time is now. Crystal Lake, here I come. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 2 of Friday the 13th, The Curse of the Jersey Devil by Rashad M. Moore. Well, we got to get to know our main character tonight, and that was pretty cool. Looking forward to seeing how this plays out. Had to brush up on Louisiana accents. Hope I did okay there for you, Rashad, on Miss Bishop. Um, yeah, good backstory on our main character, Marcus. Uh, I like the fact that he's related to Creighton. Uh, cool little nod to Child's Play and Charles Lee Ray. That was pretty freaking cool. And, uh, yeah, I think the stage is set, and uh, I'll be back very soon with Chapter 3 with Marcus heading to Crystal Lake. Curious to see how this new version of Jason is going to handle being hunted by a duke. Is he going to remember Creighton? Is he going to know that this guy's connected to Creighton somehow supernaturally? Will he, like, have a supernatural ability of seeing, you know, uh, that this is Creighton Duke's nephew? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how it turns out. Let me know and let Rashad know what you think of his story so far in the comments section below. Like I said, I'll be back very soon with more. And also, don't forget to use that promo code for 10% off of a Jugbo electronic training collar for your dog. Uh, that'll be in the pinned comments and the description of the video. Thank you so much, Jugbo, uh, for sending me that dog collar. I really am grateful for it. And I feel so much uh, better about my dog's safety. Until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying, Thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. And remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Good night.